This, this is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. I'm Dahlia Shendlin. And I'm Gilad Halpern. Every week we bring you conversations with authors and researchers about their books and other things that we find fascinating. If you like us, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter by going to our homepage. That's tlv1.fm slash review. Scroll to the bottom and click the big red button that says Patreon. Click and support us. We are counting on you. Our guest today is Professor Dan Rabinowitz of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Tel Aviv University. He's also the former chairman of Greenpeace Mediterranean, as well as uh, other organizations in different capacities. He has published widely on Israeli and Palestinian social issues, as well as on environmental issues and climate change, which is the topic of his latest book that we will discuss today. The book is called The Power of Deserts, Climate Change, the Middle East and the Promise of a Post-Oil Era. It was published in 2020 by Stanford University Press. Professor Dan Rabinowitz, hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. Hello Dalia, hello Gilad. Uh, so really, what is the place of the Middle East in the broader global scheme of climate change? Because on the one hand, it, it has its importance as a m- major generator of climate change, being the chief producer of of fossil fuels. And on the other, climate change will impact the Middle East greatly because it is one of the hottest regions in the world. You more or less answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, it is paradoxic and in many ways sort of strangely fateful that the Middle East that has been the source of so much energy and so much fossil fuel energy, no, no coal in the Middle East, but otherwise natural gas and oil, um, probably up to 50% of the entire um, amount of CO2 ever emitted to the atmosphere originated from oil and natural gas that was excavated in the Middle East, not necessarily burnt in the Middle East, but sort of went all over. And this is in historical perspective. Figures for now, are the current figures are probably lower. But it is... Um, strange and 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 really sometimes perplexing that um the the area that that had such a major role to play in the instigation of the problem in the first place is also one of those that is destined to suffer most since you use the word destined that is a direct lead into my question which is You know, the climate problem is often conveyed as a warning um, based on modeling forecasts, based on analysis of historic changes over time. But I think that future approach has sometimes left it vulnerable to criticism and controversy. Is this really going to happen? Are we being alarmist? We have to make policy recommendations because if we don't, something terrible will happen. And your first chapter analyzing what's happening in the Middle East is largely based on future-oriented Uh, problems and forecasting. Where are we in the arc of global warming, climate change, climate crisis? You know, the different different names symbolize different terms that have come to be we are to in describe a, the phenomenon. We are in a bad place, but it's going to get much worse. Part of chapter one of the book, which is really dedicated to predictions and models, is based on events that have already happened. So, I analyzed there the, the water shortage in Iran and Iraq in 2017 and 2018. There's a lot uh, in the book about the crisis in Syria uh, that started from uh, five years of consecutive droughts okay. in biblical proportions in 2006 to 2011. So I really tried to span the sort of prediction of the future and the current events as we see them and as we record them to get the sense, which I think many people in many parts of the world are getting now, that the future is here, that uh, we don't know, we don't, no longer have the privilege of uh, talking about what might happen in 30 or 40 or 50 years to our children and grandchildren, but are actually experience, experiencing things that we can see, we can measure, and we can see the repercussions already around us. So you don't have to tell 
to, to, to sort of belabor the point about Syria because people know that they've seen two and a half million refugees dispersed to Turkey and Jordan and Europe. And they know that the body count in Syria is half a million. Yes, not all of it has been direct a direct result of climate change, but climate change and food shortage has been uh, the trigger that sort of multiplied other problems to create this horrendous situation. So I think that to answer your question, Dalia, I think we are sort of in the middle of between um, a past in which we could sort of soothe ourselves by saying, okay, it's, 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 it's down the road, and a present where everything is becoming very vivid, and most in, in, the, in the Middle East more than in other places. So, so why have decision makers around the world been so reluctant slash unable to tackle uh, global warming, climate change, um, effectively? Now we see certain you know, new voices coming from the White House with the Green New Deal and uh, the Biden administration, etc. But it still seems very incipient. Do you see this as some sort of a promise that might, you know, reverse the course of history or at least mitigate it? Absolutely. I think that the, the Biden-Harris um, administration is excellent news for the climate and for the future of humanity. What I would say is that when you look at it in, in perspective of the last 30 years, but and, and even if you look at what Biden and Harris and, 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 and like-minded leaders elsewhere are trying to do, think about climate change and the climate crisis as the politician's nightmare, not in, only in the sense that, you know, it's daunting, it's, it's overwhelming, it's, it's, it's such a large problem, but also that measures that you will take today are likely only to work or bring change in a decade. Now, politicians don't like that. They, they, and I'm talking about good politicians with, with good intentions and with good, good capabilities. They like to have things done um, during their shift. And I think that's been um, an, sort of an arresting mechanism for real political, effective political um, mobilization uh, around, around climate change. Politicians like growth. They like splendor. They like success. They like achievements. And we are actually asking ourselves as humans and the, the political systems in which we live to contract or to preserve, um, to restrain, uh, and, to, and to transform from fossil fuels, which have been very cozy and worked very well for the nexus between big money and big power. And we are asking everybody now to depart. Well, except that to go, to kind of to bring this back a little bit to something you mentioned before, those kind of interests uh, overlap with political dynamics that can be very dangerous. So if the Middle East has been in part responsible for bringing us to this point, partly because of the convenience to politicians, it's also the Middle East, as you point out, for example, in Syria, that is seeing devastating effects of this. And I want to ask you to expand on that a little bit, uh, because I think not everybody is aware of what seems to you so obvious, which is that there was a climate-related trigger to the crisis in Syria that's been so devastating, and Sudan, as you cover in the book. Can you explain how that overlaps with politics in the region in ways that are not so beneficial to politicians? Well, Syria's breadbasket is the northeastern provinces. And um, this is where Syrians were producing their food since the 1960s and 70s uh, with Good success using the water from the Euphrates uh, and a very big development plan that was put together since the 70s. Um, when this long series of droughts came in 2006 to 2011, many of the deficiencies of the Syrian state were exposed the fact that the system wasn't really geared for crisis, and in this case, a water crisis. S Turkey to the north was now using more of the Euphrates water because it had its own problems with the same drought. Um, there was an inefficient, sometimes corrupt distribution system for the water, 
And within two or three years of this five-year-long drought, you had water crisis on a, 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 and, and food crisis on a, on a massive scale. And the people who were farming the land there could no longer stay there because they couldn't make a living. So they started to leave. And before you knew it, you had a food crisis that was affecting the rest of Syria. Syria could no longer feed itself, multiplied by an internal refugee and displacement crisis. And these people leaving the northeast were going towards the main metropolis of, uh, of Syria, but they were not welcome there. They were not of the dominant ethnic group, and none of the large cities of Syria, which is a poor country even to begin with, was geared to cater for them. So now you have hundreds and thousands of, of, uh, of thousands of people uh, congregating into towns that are ill-equipped and unwilling to accommodate them. And the ethnic issue is there, and you have fundamentalist Islam lurking in the background to capitalize on any ruptures. Now, this uh, soon became an impossible combination of, of, of troubles and, and soon deteriorated to um, civil unrest, large-scale um, protests, um, clamped down by the authoritarian government, and you had civil war. Um, very, very quickly. Sudan had a different kind of, the, the details were different, but again, desertification, long droughts, um, ethnic divisions multiplied by food crisis, uh, resource tensions, and eruption. I guess what I'm trying to figure out is maybe the politicians around the world will now see this as a warning sign if they connect the crisis, climate crisis-related triggers to these devastating political, you know, breakdowns in those countries. Do you think that the global leaders or the politicians are, seeing, are able to see that? I'm sure, they, I'm sure they are, both global leaders but also regional leaders, uh, because the writing is on the wall. Um, Sudan and Syria could become the new normal, because look around the Middle East and also look in other parts of the world, and the combination of deteriorating climate more dryness, less water, less food, ethnic divisions, internal displacement, conflict, civil war, and large-scale refugee waves looms everywhere. Um, around the Middle East, you have this, this combination of, 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 uh, of circumstances at various degrees of severity, but you have them in many places, not everywhere. Um, and I think that, that people, uh, look, the CIA in 1995 came out with a report, actually composed a report that, what, that only came out about a decade later, that uh, identified climate change as the single most important cause for conflict and geopolitical instability in the 21st century. This is in, back in 1995 prophetic and so 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 the, the the writing is on the wall and and people see it whether or not they are willing to do something about it or to do the right thing about it you know this is the big question of our time exactly and that also brings me to my big question of our time which is about the it emerges from from the, your book that there is a, a gordian knot between climate change and capitalism and the system as it works do you think that um tackling it effectively would require an overhaul or maybe significant changes to the uh, economic and global system that's been running the world for decades, if not centuries? I think this over, overhaul to the, to the economic system and to capitalism is something that I wouldn't endorse any day. I think there are so many good reason, reasons to, to do that. And we get our um, indications from all parts of the world on a weekly basis. Capitalism is a broken system. Uh, it perpetuates itself very uh, successfully, but piles up more and more problems of inequality and inefficiency and, and real threat everywhere. It's, a, it's an interesting question whether we um, require fixing capitalism as a prerequisite for fixing the climate. Now, even if we did, I don't think we have the time. 
because the climate crisis is something that is, as we said before, no longer looming. It's actually rolling at us. And, and, and in effect, in the book, what I do is, as you say, I recognize the, 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 the Gordian knot with, between ca- capitalism and, and climate, but I sort of leave capitalize, capitalism be for the duration of the book and see whether very urgently something could be done about climate that would still not require dismantling capitalism and, and, even, and even using some of the energies that are instigated by capitalism to bring about change in terms of climate change. Now, it's a risk because, you know, many, many people reading the book say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm probably giving capitalism a lease of life and maybe the two... Um, struggles have to happen hand in hand and, and sort of feed into each other. Um, maybe they, maybe they, they, they would, but I, I really think that the, that, that the ultimate test of our times is, is climate, and therefore I pick my battle. And I say the most urgent battle right now, this decade, probably the next by 2040, is... Um, is climate change, and we may be able to sort of use the, the energies of capitalism in order to bring us to a better place also on, 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 on climate. Or we won't have a choice. Um, I want to ask you about one of the major sources of potential uh, improvement in the situation, because this whole conversation is getting a little apocalyptic <laughs> for me. But um, tell us about renewable energies. What are the main issues surrounding renewable energies? Are they you know, the source of our salvation? What are the opportunities for the Middle East? Dangers? Economic dangers? Anything? So actually, I'm, I'm actually hopeful about renewable energy. And I think that uh, renewable energy is now in a good place to become a very positive vector in this struggle. Um, 50% of greenhouse gas emissions globally come from production of electricity because we burn so much coal and natural gas and in some places even oil in uh, conventional power stations. And the transition to renewables has already started and is actually going very strong in, in in a number of places, in West Europe, in North Europe, even in America. What about Israel? Israel is okay. Uh, it's not the sort of leader in harnessing the sun as it was in nineteen in the nineteen fifties with the solar panels on top of every house in Israel to bring water to forty or forty five degrees so that you can take a shower. Uh, it, it's not where it was then. It's 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 doing okay, but it's not a leading force. Um, but I think globally, what's been been happening is that. Um, you know, 20 years ago, people like me and organizations like Greenpeace and other environmental organizations were preaching for renewables, in fr- in, but, with it, but were facing an impossible economic situation because renewables were so expensive. Um, between 2009 and 2020, the price of generating electricity from renewable energy went down 95%. Why? Because technology became better, production became larger, and now you can uh, install um, electricity f- from a um, PV, uh, photovoltaic uh, panels, for um, $35, uh, sometimes $25, depends where you are, per megawatt, whereas in 2009 you had to pay 360 now, this is a real revolution, and so it's happening. This transition is happening, not necessarily because everybody was convinced by Al Gore or uh, Greta Thunberg. It was uh, people were convinced by their balance sheets, and energy captains all around the world un- un- understand that this is the future. So, so I'm hopeful about that. And, of course, the Middle East has an immense potential because, first of all, um, there's more sun in the Middle East than anywhere else. 300 um, sunny days a year and, and very high insulation levels, probably on, on average about 
twice the the the, the global average because because we have uh, we don't have this these long and dark win- win- winters and we don't have the cloud cover of the t- tropics so the subtropics are really very good for sun secondly because there's some so little water in the middle east that there's so much available land deserts are unproductive and there are millions of square miles of them which could be used for large scale solar panel fields that could then start creating and it's happening and it's been happening in Morocco and in Egypt and in the Gulf a little bit in Israel uh, as well as elsewhere so the transformation of electricity production from fossil fuels to renewable energy is happening and it's happening fast and it's accelerating and looking to the future solar is going to be the dominant form of renewable energy more than hydroelectric and more than wind for a variety of reasons So there the Middle East has something to offer. And now you have to, to couple this with another transition which is happening in transportation. Transportation is, is accountable for 25 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions, and we know where transportation is going. It's going electric. Now, if it's going electric, as at the same time as power production is going renewable, Then we have a, a gain, a net gain of uh, less uh, polluting and, and, uh, and, and, and less pr- production of, of, of electricity that is, that is associated with greenhouse gas emissions. So in, in these respects, the, the, the Middle East and especially the, the, the oil countries of the Middle East are perched to become major players. What would you say are the prospects of harnessing Middle Eastern governments to tackle uh, these issues? Because they haven't been exactly exemplary when it comes to corruption and stability and all those things that require you know, a, a action on such a large scale. Can we do business with them? Or if not, can we do business without them? Well, first of all, uh, look at what they say rather than what they do. Okay. Uh, the major oil producing countries uh, of the Middle East, the, the Gulf countries, and I'm focusing in the book mainly on the GCC, the Gulf Corporation Council. Saudi Arabia is the leader, it's the largest of them, but uh, Kuwait and uh, Oman and United Arab Emirates and Qatar and Bahrain are the other five. And they have been issuing formal statements and position papers and blueprints and vision papers Uh, papers for the future since the early 21st century that have all emphasized renewable energy. So they are the ones who, it, at least when you look at their statements, and for the last 20 years have been all over renewables, citing some of the um, advantages that, 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 that we've just mentioned, that there's so much sun, that there's so much land available. that uh, they have the capital because you do need to invest up front when you do renewables and that they like integrating new technologies into the civil infrastructure which they do when you come to look at what they've actually done for the last 20 years it's a different story to this to the extent that you might even suggest that in the case of Saudi Arabia um, maybe these um, very people grandiose and sometimes even pompous um, statements about how renewable they're going to, to, to go and how much they're going to reduce their dependence on um, on oil maybe this was even deliberate because they've done really very little uh, only about less than one percent of Saudi Arabia uh, Saudi Arabian electricity is actually generated by renewables in Although the potential is there, it's a huge empty country that could do it. Um, so, 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 it's a, so it's a mixed bag. Judge them by what they want. They say that they want to do. They could become world leaders. Judge them by what they've actually done. Only the United Arab Emirates, with three and a half percent of its electricity now being produced from renewables, is anywhere in the, in, 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 in the, in the big league of Of, uh, of international uh, um, of the international competition for for, for, for the renewable transition um, and, and and you're right in asking about governments and regimes when it comes to this transition because it's not a, an easy transition for anyone to do 
especially not countries that are reliant on the sale of natural gas and oil and have been for the last 60 or 70 years uh, for their income and, and, and budget. Um, why should they sort of voluntarily um, go in a direction that would take the hen that um, produces their golden eggs and, you know, slaughter it under the tree? Um, so that's, that, that's a big challenge. I think, however, that the, 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 the other factor that we must fac- uh, introduce here, and this is what I do in the final chapter of the book, is post-oil. Post-oil is a game changer. And when I say post-oil, I'm talking about the point, the theoretical point in the future, maybe it's already happened in 2019, when oil demand and oil sales will have peaked and have started going down. Um, 20 years ago, um, uh, um, peak oil was associated with diminished supply. So people thought that oil might run out. It's not. It's not running out anywhere. We have oil for another 100 years. What is running out is demand. Because of the renewable revolution uh, and because of other reasons, we are now looking at a future in which in a few years, maybe a decade, maybe less, demand of oil could be decimated by 50%. Now, when you factor that in to the worldview of large and wealthy oil producers in the Middle East, that uh, is putting them in a completely different place. The future is not going to be as they had the last 60 or 70 years, which has produced extraordinary wealth. And, uh, and, and not only for the Middle East. D- did we get a taste of this during Corona when all of a sudden oil prices bottomed out? I, I think it was driven by the lack of demand. Absolutely. Um, in March and April and May 2020, uh, demand for oil was... Um, Negatively priced, right? Negatively pl- priced. Because, <laughs> I never heard of that before. Yeah. <laughs> Negatively priced because uh, shipments that had been in high seas were now approaching their destinations in North America and in, in Europe, um, but the um, storage places were still full because nobody was using oil during this time. So you had oil sitting on the high seas costing lots of money and somebody had to pay for it. And this is why they were willing to to, to give it away uh, and, and even give you money for it. But that was only for a few months. Yes, I think COVID-19 and the, dem- and the, and the slumping demand for, for, uh, d- demand for oil was a real interesting um, wake-up call uh, for Middle Eastern, but also for other uh, oil producers, that um, the bounty of oil is about to end. And in a way, a paradoxic thing happened as a result. You would say that if the price of oil was going down very steeply in, in, in the spring of 2020, oil might come back and gain some ground against renewables that were nibbling at it for the, for the, for the previous 10 years because they were becoming so cheap. But what happened in COVID-19 also was that the fragility Um, of the supply chain in the oil industry became very, very apparent. When oil prices went down below 40 and then 30 and then $20 a barrel, some major oil oil fields were terminated or at least were shut off. And then people realized that to start them on again, it's not just a turnkey or press a button. It's a complicated and very expensive process and uh, analysts throughout 2020 were more and more coming down on the side and saying the oil industry may never recover from the COVID-19. It's, 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 it has recovered since, but it did expose the fragility of the supply chain, which pushed people, even as, as oil was being so, so cheap, it pushed people for, in the long run, to commission solar energy uh, power stations rather than new um, oil or uh, uh, or natural gas ones. I guess what I'm really trying to get at is, are those countries that are heavily dependent on oil income uh, starting to make you know, alternate plans and retool their economies? I sadly or, you know, something don't think that the entire global economy is going to restructure itself, but that there will have to be some meeting between economic change and, you know, shift of energy resources. Are countries now after COVID saying we better diversify 
our sources of income? During the COVID lockdown of um, spring 2020, the Saudi government's uh, main investment fund went on a, on a buying spree all around the world of anything that has nothing to do with, uh, with, with energy. They were bu- buying cruise ships and they were buying internet companies and they were buying food production. So the, 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 the short answer to, to, to your question is absolutely yes. And I think they realize that they need to divert, they need to, um, to actually do what they've been declaring that they want to do since 2000. Um, and, and this is where I sort of jump in with my concluding idea in the book. And that is that some of these reinvestment that they're, that they're doing, they might be doing in renewable energy, both at home, but also in generating capa- generation capacity around the world. And if they do that, they would be in position in five or 10 or 15 years from now to proactively shut off their own production of natural gas and oil because they are already so well invested in renewables. So they will have accomplished this uh, perfect uh, miracle of taking their market power in oil and transforming it into a similar share of the market uh, of the energy of the future. Uh, now, this uh, is not an easy transition to do. But in, in my book, I sort of venture and say, since uh, post-oil is around the corner, and as the post-normal climate condition is upon them, and since they do realize that they need to do something, why don't they combine the two? Invest and, and go renewable now, in spite, sort of in spite of themselves, and then eventually bring the end of oil in a proactive manner on which they can still have some control and shape the transition rather than become sort of passive victims of it. I'd like to take us uh, to in a, in a different direction, and perhaps that will be our concluding question, unless Dalia has something else to add, and ask you about yourself as a uh, sociology professor, um, writing about these issues uh, copiously, and I want to ask you perhaps you know a general question about the role of social science in tackling um, climate change, as opposed to climate scientists who do their share. It's interesting you should, you should ask. Uh, earlier today, we had a um, high-level meeting at Tel Aviv University uh, of a, a committee that was going to ratify a plan I have to have a master's program, in English, by the way, in climate, society, and policy. And I was asked exactly that. Obviously, I was asked that by people from the natural sciences and from the um, geosciences, why and people with the money, of course. Uh, yes. <laughs> and they were asking, you know, why? what do the social sciences have to offer? Why should we have a master's degree in climate change, society, and, and, and policy? No, but Gilad said to explain the role. They said, why should we have it? <laughs> no, it's, it's pretty much the same question. And you had a dry run, so let's hear the answer. And Gilad is more polite. <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, I think probably more supportive, intuitively. And but 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 they were asking it in an inquisitive way and not in a provocative way and and I think the outcome of the of the of the meeting was was the right one because um, they obviously uh, saw the, the the logic of it. It's true that when the climate crisis began taking shape, everybody was thinking about it in terms of physics, chemistry, atmospheric science, um, biology, and it played out. Quite obviously, in even in the in the uh, composition of the um, uh, of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the which is the advisory um, body for the UN uh, Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change. So this is a collection of scientists who are advising governments and the UN about this, the the f- the future of of science, and for. For the first two decades of its existence, the IPCC was only atmospheric science people and meteorologists. And NASA's meteorology department was really very important there. So it was really a matter of, of scientists debating, you know, how fast will the atmosphere change and, how, and, and what the impacts would be. 
But then from within their ranks came the demand for social sciences, for policy, for economists, for international relations, because we are looking at um, an, an, a pact that has to be agreed by so many countries with so many divergent interests. And of course, the inequality that is um, uh, part and parcel of the climate crisis. Um, countries in different parts of the world are exposed differently because some are in arid areas and some are in, in, the, in the far north and might even benefit from warming up, you know, the Russian tundra or the Chinese tundra or the sub, sub, subpolar areas in Canada. So, and <laughs> others... Canada is suffering right now because of climate change. Uh, yes, but in a paradoxic way, because in, 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 in many other ways, you might say that the northern territories of Canada could have a bonanza of agriculture, of mining, and lots of other things. So, so exposure is differentiated. And resilience is, is differentiated because if you are a rich country and have technology and the, and, 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 the, and the state is very effective and you know how to, 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 to deal with emergencies, your chances for deliverance is, is much higher. Um, and the third element of inequality is responsibility. Some countries have contributed more to the greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere than others. So wherever you look, from whichever direction you look at climate change, you are in the, in the thick of thinking about social, economic, and political inequalities. Can I make an observation that I think also COVID has taught us that it can never be just about biology because human behavior was the critical driving factor in curbing or exacerbating COVID? What do you think of that? Absolutely. I think that in, 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 in these terms, the, the parallels between um, COVID and climate change are, uh, are, are really striking. Um, it's a global issue. It has biological elements in it, but response to it is primarily politics, morality, sensibilities, people's decisions and how you could sway them. You know, will they vaccinate? Will they not? Will they invest in vaccination? Will they not? Uh, yes, I think that uh, in, this, in this respect, uh, facing a sort of looking, looking down the abyss of a global pandemic or, glo or, or global um, uh, crisis situation forces us to, to, to look deep into our civilization and realize that it's, yeah, yes, we cannot do it without biologists and, and, and earth scientists and atmospheric experts. But eventually it will come down to people sitting together, identifying the problem, bringing up solutions, making decisions, convincing others, having other stakeholders, caring for each other and not sort of only delivering each, each of us on our own. These are classical social science uh, issues. So, um, so I think we will have this uh, masters in climate change, uh, <laughs> congratulations, social and and policy studies in the end. If you'd like to, uh, there was just one passage that I found very, very succinctly seemed to encapsulate the entire dilemma. Maybe you could read it to us and explain which direction you think we're taking. It's right here. So, in the book, I say, and I quote. The wrestling match against climate change is, by definition, a race against time. The tipping point where fossil fuels are finally eclipsed must be attained before climate change hits the point of no return, unleashing a variety of feedback mechanisms that could push the biosphere to the abyss. It's a sobering um, sentence, um, but something that that, that I and many other people are thinking a lot, a lot about. Um, it's probably between now and 2040 that, 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 that our fate as, as a civiliz civilization would, would be sealed. Um, we could face uh, sort of runaway uh, heating up of, of the planet with temperatures shooting three and four and five and six degrees above what we've known uh, in a very short short time um, 
And, and this is the time for us to, to take action, to learn, to understand, and, and, and to do something about it. And, and, and there's no guarantee that we will be able to do it. We've been in denial for too long, probably until the late 1990s, maybe even the first decade of the 21st century. People are still in denial. <laughs> Some people are still in denial. I think they are get, getting less, even in the Republican Party. Um, and despair is already sort of looming as the next stage. And I would say that the window of opportunity between denial and despair is where action can actually take place. And, and the window is narrowing. So we need to do something quick. And on this really inspiring note, uh, we'll Yalla. end it there. <laughs> Professor Dan Rabinowitz, Professor of uh, Sociology and Anthropology at Tel Aviv University and the author of the newly published The Power of Deserts, Climate Change, the Middle East and the Promise of a Post-Oil Era. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And also big thanks to Itai Shalem, uh, the manager of TLV1 Studios and Ariel Cohen, our producer. And now we've got a request. Many or most of you listen to us on the Apple Podcasts app. And we would like to ask you to please consider writing us a review of any kind. You too can support us by going to our website and subscribing to our Patreon campaign. Please check out our archive. It has way over 600 interviews to keep you entertained, interested, and hopefully annoyed. Like us on Facebook. Our page is called the Tel Aviv Podcast Ideas from Israel. Follow me and Dalion and the podcast on Twitter. And of course, join us again for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review next week. And until then, goodbye.